welcome everyone that is joining us this evening. Uh, thank you for what I think is going to be an important and timely conversation about transforming police culture. As we know, it's been a difficult time throughout our nation, not only dealing with COVID-19, but also dealing with the issue of racial justice and in response to police use of uh, deadly force, particularly in communities of color. And as we know, there have been many demonstrations and loud calls for police accountability, reform, and transformation. And as was noted earlier, here in Washington state, lawmakers are considering a number of proposals to deal with uh, police reform and accountability. And we're going to examine some of those tonight. And I'd like to introduce our uh, panel that is joining us uh, this evening, some great uh, speakers that'll be joining us uh, with a lot of perspective on this particular issue. Um, joining us from the East Coast, Philadelphia, I believe, is Paige Fernandez. She is the National ACLU Policy Policing Advisor. Also, Ann Levison is a retired Seattle Municipal Court judge. She served two three-year terms providing independent outside oversight of Seattle's police accountability system. And in that role, she has uh, reviewed all complaints of misconduct and all misconduct investigations. She's conducted a special review of the police uh, disciplinary systems and made recommendations for policy training and system reform. She served as a subject matter expert for the Community Police Commission regarding police accountability, police collective bargaining agreements, and she helped draft uh, Seattle's 2017 Police Accountability Ordinance and provided an expert witness declaration on, on behalf of the community as part of the federal consent decree. Thank you very much for joining us, Han. We're also joined by Sue Rar. Sue is the executive director of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, uh, where they train police officers in our state. She heads the academy there. She was also a former King County Sheriff, as well as a member of the task force on 21st century policing during the Obama administration. Thanks for joining us, Sue. Good to have you here. Also with us is Tim Raynon, former a Puyallup Tribal Council member. He is the co-chair of uh, Deescalate Washington, the I-940 campaign. He's also currently a member of the Governor's Task Force on Independent Investigations of Police Use of Force. Thank you all for joining us. And for those of you that are joining us this evening here online, uh, you also can participate in this uh, conversation. You can send us your questions via the Q&A box and the dialogue here here on Zoom, and uh, we will do our best to uh, work your questions and comments into the conversation. Well, let me start with you, Paige, um, from a national perspective. And I, I, this is a question I'm going to really ask everybody, and that is um, the issue of police reform and accountability in the, these times. Why has this become such a uh, uh, priority for ACLU? Absolutely. Um, well, I first want to just start with like a few facts and figures to throw out there. First is that one in 1000 black men will die at the hands of police. Police violence is a leading cause of death for black men in this country. 13 of the 100 largest US city police departments kill black men at higher rates than the US murder rate. Police departments across the country have a collective budget of over $115 billion and 10.3 million arrests are made every year. I think this really shines light on the huge role police play across the country. Um, and I think people who work on policing and people on this panel have known for years, for decades, what a severe problem police brutality, police violence and police abuse of power is. But this summer, I think it was put on full display for everyone in this nation to witness. During the past five years of the BLM movement, elected officials have continued to pass minor reforms, um, but we know now that it's time for bold transformational changes, changes to reduce the roles, responsibilities, and power of police, um, specifically their abuse of power, 
time to abolish qualified immunity, to require de-escalation, to end police union abuse of power and remove problematic provisions from police union contracts that don't allow for police to be held accountable. I think people are finally reckoning with the fact that we can no longer tinker around the edges. And I'm really excited to be here today to discuss how the Washington legislator can pass legislation to implement transformational changes we need to see in order to end police violence. All right, thank you, Paige. Um, Surar, I'm gonna to turn to you as someone who uh, heads up uh, the place that trains officers and uh, as they uh, seek to become law enforcement officials here in Washington state. Uh, tough time in a way if you're, if you're uh, in law enforcement, but your take on this. It's very challenging. Well, I think that there's many things that Paige said that I, I agree with. We need, to, we need to engage in bold transformational change. Um, I absolutely agree. We need better account accountability. We need more transparency. But I don't want us to stop at just focusing on the frontline officer on the street. That's not going to be enough to bring real change to the people in the community that are most affected by police action. Um, I have a favorite quote that I, that I turn to in many presentations, and this will be no exception. And it's Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, who is an incredible um, thinker about the issue of, of policing. And he says, he says, a reform that begins with the officer on the beat is not reform at all, it's avoidance. It's the continuation of Americans' preference for considering the actions of bad individuals as opposed to the function and intention of systems. So I wanna reiterate, we do need better accountability. We do need better, better um, transparency, but we have to come to grips with the more, the more fundamental problem. And that is we have a system that works exactly as it was intended to work. And that was to, was to capitalize on a loophole in the 13th amendment to create a free work workforce and the ability to continue using slavery by using the label of felon to continue to enslave people and use their labor. That system has never been fundamentally changed. You layer on top of that decades of propaganda of, that dehumanizes people of color, um, native peoples, and all of those messages are woven into the fabric of our community. Uh, police like to like to joke around and say we are the armed protectors of the status quo. Well, I'm afraid that police are the armed protectors of the status quo. And I think we're, we have to reckon with the fact that the status quo has to change. We can change out individual officers, we can pull the bad apples out of the barrel, but the barrel is rotten and we have to fix the barrel. Um, and, and I do fear that we are going to focus so much on individual police accountability that we're going to miss opportunities to make real systemic change. Uh, and let me follow up on that in, in that uh, I think oftentimes we, as Sue says, uh, we're putting such a focus on, on the police officer, but are we not putting enough focus on the system? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Let me just reinforce, I agree with both the, what Paige and Sue have said, and also thank you to the ACLU for hosting this discussion. Um, I do a lot of work around system, on system, complex system reform, whether it has to do with child welfare or juvenile justice or uh, firearms violence. And policing is no different in that we do have systems that are designed to accomplish other purposes that we as a society don't necessarily find acceptable today. And our systems and the people in them are, uh, we have embedded in them cultures, practice, norms, training, um, that is just not, does not comport with what we want to see in terms of everyone in our society being treated fairly and equitably and the police not being a force, but being a service. They are there to provide support and safety, they are not to be um, occupying forces. So I think we have a real opportunity this session to affect uh, lasting and impactful reforms regarding how officers are hired, how they're trained, how they're disciplined for misconduct. Um, and 
to, at the same time, not these are not mutually exclusive propositions, at the same time to be really clear about listening to the public about what they want their law enforcement to do, as well as how they want it done. And this is, this is something uh, we've not seen, at least in my professional career, where we'll have this opportunity for significant meaningful reform that is just, it's critically important to law enforcement legitimacy. People need to have a voice and policymakers need to ensure that dis disparate impacts um, that have been caused by these longstanding practices are finally addressed. So I think we can affect individual officer conduct and as well as the systemic issues that we need to address. And I, I think we have to for the families and communities who have suffered these harms for decades, we can't keep putting this on their backs to try to fix community by community, contract by contract, chief by chief. We've got to be there for them and we have to set best practices as well as prohibit practices that we know do not serve the public well. Uh, Tim Raynard, as someone who is uh, part of the governor's task force looking at this, you were also uh, part of the campaign uh, to pass uh, I-940, which uh, uh, also puts some onus on police officers in Washington state. So your take on what's happening now or the opportunity for what could happen? Yeah, I, I think now is the, the best time that I can recall in, in, in my lifetime for us to really start to take a look and, and implement changes to the system. Um, the, the, the experiences over the, over the past summer that uh, Paige mentioned and, and for us individually in our tribe, you know, we lost one of our, our tribal members a, a couple years ago and that's how we first got involved in this. And, you know, we have to seize this opportunity to make those changes in, in the system that, that's going to prevent others from experiencing what our community, what the families that have been impacted by police violence, um, you, you know, have experienced. And, and to really start to, to dismantle that, that racist system that we have. And in the end, you know, we're, we're hoping to uh, find justice for those that have lost a loved one at the hands of police. And I think our, our, our society, our communities are more ready than ever before to really you know, roll up our sleeves and, and get into this work and really make real sustainable change that's going to have direct impacts on families, on communities, and ultimately make our communities safer for all of us. That's what we're, we're, we're aiming for. Um, let me ask you, Paige, uh, are we at a generational moment, I guess? I, I look at it, what's happened with uh, the, after the shooting particularly of George Floyd, but we, we knew that there had already been other incidents, uh, not the shooting of him, but the, his death, already incidents in, 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 that had happened regarding police. But is, is this a major moment for shift, not only we're, we're taking a hard look here in Washington state, but are you seeing this actually happening elsewhere in the country? Yes, absolutely. This discussion is not unique to Washington state. It is happening everywhere in every state in every municipality across this country. I think it's really important to think about that because policing is such a localized issue that every state, every municipality, every town, every city is grappling with policing, with police violence, and how to move forward. And I really appreciate Sue's perspective that this is, you know, we need to think big about the entire system and all the changes that need to be made in this system to end these injustices. But this absolutely is, you know, at the forefront of conversations across the country. I think moving into 2021, we will see hundreds thousands of bills being introduced in state legislatures across the country to address police violence, to address police accountability, police transparency, a range of policing issues. Um, 
you know, there have been plenty of task force developed since George Floyd's murder. A lot of legislators have gathered. I'm thinking specifically about Delaware, where their legislators formed a task force following George Floyd's murder to examine existing state laws on policing, specifically their Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which kind of codifies police union contract provisions and state law. Um, and trying to think through what next steps will be. And so I think you will see a lot of bills being introduced um, and a lot of discussions happening over the course of 2021 in every state um, across the political spectrum. And let me go to you. Uh, let's start talking about what's happening here in Washington State. I know both you and Sue, and I'm sure Tim have been really, really aware, uh, well aware of what is happening, uh, at least proposals that uh, may be coming up in the next session of the Washington Legislature after the first of the year. Um, and let's start with the issue of, uh, I guess, de-escalation of uh, police officers and maybe a, a force in general. So what are we seeing? Well, I think you're going to see easily a dozen very substantive bills here this session. Um, you've mentioned, folks have mentioned a few of them already. We'll talk more about independent investigations. There'll be a bill on tactics that will address chokeholds and uh, neck restraints, the uh, no, what so-called no-knock warrants, uh, the use of police dogs, the use of vehicle pursuits and uh, tear gas military equipment and even uh, disallowing, prohibiting officers from being able to cover their badges or their identifying information. Um, when it comes to excessive force and de-escalation, um, there's a really thoughtful bill pending that would uh, include things such as requiring officers to exhaust available and appropriate uh, de-escalation tactics prior to using any physical force. So that's things like when I used to review these investigations, these are the kind of questions I would ask, which is, did they take steps to uh, create physical distance and cover or reposition themselves so that force wasn't necessary? When there were multiple officers, are they clear about who's the one communicating? Otherwise officers, when there are multiple officers can be communicating contradictory direction uh, to the individual who then doesn't know what to do or is then seen to be disobeying, if you will. Um, did they call for additional resources such as crisis intervention or mental health professionals? Did they call for backup? Did they take the time that was needed? And, or did they take uh, steps or take actions that actually then created the situation that required force to be used? So all of those things will be addressed in the bill and it'll require nonviolent tactics to prevent or otherwise reduce the likelihood of violence. You know, one of the things that we've seen in a lot of these cases is officers may not be taking into consideration the characteristics and the conditions of the person with whom they're interacting. Uh, is the person a minor? Is the individual pregnant? Uh, do they look like they're in behavioral crisis or do they have some other um, disabilities or impairments? Is it a vulnerable adult? Do they have limited English proficiency? Um, there are a number of things that officers should be attentive to when they are issuing orders and then taking action because they think someone is not complying. Let me move over to Sue and, and get her, her input on this. Um, and that, Sue, I'm kind of, I'm curious as someone uh, that works with those wanting to be officers, but also, you know, a lot of folks that are officers, as they hear these types of proposals, um, what, I guess, are the concerns that you're hearing from them? And do you have concerns about some of this? Well, I, I wish I had recorded what Anne was saying because she's literally gone step by step in the training that we are providing at the academy. All, all of the steps of de-escalation, it, it's no longer enough to look at the moment the deadly force was used. We have to back up about 10 minutes and we have to look at what, what preceded the event. Number one, why were the police even called in the first place? That, that's first and foremost. And then, the, the, the training, the way the training is laid out, every step of the way they're trained to make sure you're giving yourself more options by creating time, distance and shielding. And we're doing a lot of training from neurological exercises to calm, for the officer to calm themselves down, to deescalate themselves first so that they're using clear thinking. 
And, and again, the, the whole focus is on slow down, slow the action down. So many of these awful videos we've seen are the results of officers rushing in too quickly. And that was the traditional training going back 15, 20, 25 years. And it's been a challenge to overcome the culture of get in and use overwhelming force. And so there is a lot of resistance by folks who've been in law enforcement for a long time. So we have to overcome that culture. But the training that we're, we're delivering absolutely mirrors exactly what Anne is describing. We've gone so far as creating a video of how not to do it with officers rushing up to a car where they think there's an armed suspect to getting behind the car. The officers decide ahead of time who's gonna call out commands. Um, Anne mentioned vehicle chases. Um, if I was the queen of the world, we wouldn't do high-speed vehicle pursuits. I, I just, I could talk for hours on that, but that, that alone is a decision that is made at a policy level by a chief, by a mayor, by a city council. Are we going to tell our police officers that we want them to use extremely dangerous tactics to catch a person driving a stolen car? No, if my kid is out on the street, if my grandchildren are out on the street, I don't want a police car going 50 miles an hour down a residential street to apprehend a suspect. Um, the Breonna Taylor case it is such a tragic example of poor policy. Why would we do a dynamic entry, kick in somebody's door in the middle of the night so that we can get evidence of drug dealing? And that's a policy question. That's a question for the city council, for the mayor, for the police chief. Are we going to engage in behavior, kicking in a door in the middle of the night to secure evidence for a drug case? So yes, I, I will continue to go back to, we can tweak the frontline officer, but it is these bad public policies that continue to put officers in situations that are likely to, to create danger and how much danger are we as a society willing to accept to apprehend a suspect in an auto theft, in a drug possession case. We as a society, we have to say, stop doing that. It's not worth the risk. Well, that comes back to what Paige said about, I suppose it all comes back to what's local. And that is, uh, what are the policies of a department uh, created either from a city or the department itself, and how they handle that, and and how these ha they handle these situations. I want to move over to Tim and Tim. Can I know. I, can I interrupt for just a yes, second? Go ahead. I think we also have to come to grips with our communities are not united about what they want. Hmm. We have the dominant class community members, and we have the lower caste members of the community. And we really have to come to grips because I think there's a lot of people that are perfectly willing to accept a lot of risk to catch an auto thief, to catch a drug dealer. So we can't assume that the community is united in what they want from their police. How do we deal with that then? Let me follow that up. Anne, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I was just going to weigh in. I agreed with about 90% of what Sue said <laughs> until the end, which is... You don't always agree with Sue? Oh, that's surprising. <laughs> So um, we go way back. Yeah. So the, the, uh, I have moved past the conclusion that it is up to mayors and city councils and chiefs to set these policies. I, I think that is exactly why we're in front of the state legislature all across the country this year, that we need the public to say what is and what isn't acceptable in terms of how policing is done. And we need standards that are not uh, subject to negotiation and bargaining. I, I, the analogy I make, Enrique, sometimes to folks is look at other essential government services. We don't say, hey, with regard to food standards or health standards or land use standards, anything where we're protecting community, oh, let's just decide one off and then we'll negotiate and we can weaken it or uh, undercut it. We set best practices, the public weighs in, it's transparent, it guides us, and no one is allowed to weaken it or corrode it. And certainly, we don't make the public pay extra in order to have those best practices from their government. So I'm with Sue on everything she said, other than I don't think we can leave it up to local uh, communities 
uh, to be doing this anymore. It's just impossible for then for families and for the public to get consistent best practices um, across the state. And that's really what we need. I want to get Tim to weigh in on this, uh, this part of the discussion as well. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Anne here. Um, we, uh, we need statewide standards. We need to change the expectation of the, the minimum standards for law enforcement. No matter what community you live in, you should be secure in knowing that your police are going to act a certain way, a, a certain minimum standard. And so that's why, you know, we, we, we are really advocating for a statewide, sta statewide standard of police use, police use of force, tactics, all of these different things. I also wanted to, to, to kind of address your question about how do we, how do we address the, the issue of bringing you know, communities together. Um, it really, it, it starts with impacted families and impacted communities being at the table, coming to the forefront and, and demanding change and also being willing to bring the, the community together. We, we need to have more of these, these opportunities to sit down and listen to one another. You know, I, 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 unless and until you have walked in the shoes of a black person or a brown person, you're not going to appreciate the things that, that we have to live with on a daily basis. And somehow we need to, to get the majority, as, as was referenced earlier, to understand that they don't necessarily understand where we're coming from. And so somehow we've got to bridge that gap. We've got to help people understand that when my young, young adult boys go out into, the, into the, the streets or when they're driving down the road, I'm worried about whether they're going to come home safely or not if they're, if they're stopped by a police officer. I've experienced having my son call me on the phone scared because he was stopped by a police officer. And, and despite us having the, the, the conversations about you know, what to do, having the talk, uh, he still felt the need to call me and, and sitting there listening to the, the, the fear in his, his voice and being on the phone during that entire interaction, just not knowing what was going to happen. That's something that we live with on a daily basis. And so that is why we, you know, people of color, disproportionately impacted communities, we have to be leading the way in this, in this movement, in this effort. And, and so, and, and we've got to, you know, be supported and come together with our allies, those that are from the majority. We, we have so many that are, that are willing to listen and understand. That's how we're going to really start to move this, this work forward. That's why we're having this conversation right here, right now, with people like you and me and Surar, and you raise your hand, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Tim, I, I completely agree with you and Anne. It reminds me of, of the federal government intervening in the South, you know, to, to protect the rights of individuals. And, 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 and this gets us back to the system. We've built a system that is built on local control. And we're trying to overcome that by creating state mandates. I agree with what you want to do with the state mandates. But at some point we have got to address in this country, we have 18,000 different police departments. Half of them have less than 10 officers and do not have the resources, capacity or skills to do the kind of law enforcement that we all want to see. And so we have to come to grips with, are we going to change our form of government and our form of delivering police services? Because we are fighting an uphill battle. As I describe the training we give at the academy, 
we provide the type of training that I believe supports the policing that, that you are talking about. But we do meet with great resistance from many local communities. Well, let me follow up on that, Sue, as you, you mentioned earlier, and you said this earlier, uh, as if you were queen for the, the day or longer, uh, I'm sure you want to be longer. What would you do, I guess, to, to try to make it more uniform? Because, you know, you, it's very different in an urban area like Seattle than being in a small area where, where I grew up in Wapato, Washington, right. you know, with a very small police force, where the community didn't really have a lot of respect for those guys. Right. Well, and, and there's, there's variations. Many small towns have wonderful police departments and they have very good working relationships and police accountability happens in the grocery store line on Monday morning. If, if you're gonna be a police officer on the street and treat somebody badly, you know you're probably gonna run into them or your kids are gonna run into their kids. And so that, that's the advantage of small departments. But when it comes to issues on policy setting, how far will we go, how much risk will we take, I just think we need, to, we need to have a conversation in this state. Are the local jurisdictions willing to forego some of, some of that authority and say, we will agree to go along with these new requirements? I think that would be very helpful. Well, I mean, that's already a, an issue when you have like uh, the governor trying to implement people wearing yes. masks or whatever during this time of COVID. And then you have a... And they're not small departments in all of these in the case, saying that the sheriff or whatever is not going to cooperate with the state mandate. So, I mean, how do we get people to, to actually follow the guidelines for the better good? And, and that's, a, that's a challenge. That's a great challenge. It is. Yeah. Um, let, let's move on and talk about some of the other uh, proposals. I, I, I also want to be aware of time here. We're, we're getting a lot of uh, questions, and I want to make sure I have time for that. Uh, it's good to see that we have uh, almost 300 people that are with us tonight watching this and, and uh, viewing what we're, what we're talking about. Um, and that is, uh, let's go to the next issue, and one, uh, the issue that has to do, I know that this is something that you're deeply concerned with, and that is uh, Tim is uh, private investigate or independent investigations, I guess. Um, what do we know about uh, what what is happening in the legislature there? Um, Sue or Tim, do you, or Anne, either one of you, anybody want to weigh in on that? Tell us what's uh, what's going on. Well, I can start off just by saying uh, the the governor's office is is drafting legislation. Um, based upon the, the recommendations of the, the governor's task force on independent investigations. Um, there, you know, the task force, we recommended that uh, a completely independent agency be created um, that, so that we, we no longer have police investigating police. Um, and as part of that, th this agency would investigate not only police use of deadly force, but other uh, serious incidents of serious misconduct, like sexual assault by police, um, in custody deaths, those types of things. Uh, and w as part of that, we were also recommending that we have an independent prosecution uh, of, of these cases. Uh, you know, when, when you think about it, it's, it's very difficult for a colleague to investigate a colleague. And, and that's what we have right now when you have uh, departments investigating themselves, or even if you ship it out to a neighboring department, you're still having you know, police investigating police. And so- Well, that's, that's what happened in Tacoma with the Manny Ellis case and yeah. that it is- uh, yeah now being investigated or was investigated by the Washington State Patrol, I have no results yet. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're so involved uh, in this issue is because that was the same thing that happened in, in Jackie's case. Tacoma investigated Tacoma. Um, it was turned over to the Pierce County prosecutor who relies on the Tacoma police to help them do their job. Um, and, and of course, at the end of the day, they, they found the, the shooting justified. And so it, it, it just, we, we feel that there's an inherent conflict for police to investigate police 
and for county prosecutors to uh, prosecute police who they rely on for their for, to do their job. And so that's what we're asking for right. a completely independent agency to be created. Andy, you want to weigh in on that? I, I think Tim said it well. I think for those of us who've been in this field a while, we used to think that if you had a different law enforcement agency do it, that independence would suffice. But we've learned over the years that's not sufficient. So um, having further independence for any uh, incidents where law enforcement's involved and there's significant bodily harm or there's uh, death, regardless of whether it's uh, caused by a gun or in custody death or during transport, um, the more independence we can have, I think, uh, the more we will enhance community uh, trust and confidence in the fairness and the legitimacy um, of the investigation. So how do you feel about it? I, I, I agree with the perspectives of Anne and Tim. Um, I, I will say that the, the cynical side of me wonders, will the state pay enough and will they continue to fund this? Because it, it will be extremely expensive to have, to have an investigative body that has the capacity to respond anywhere in the state and then do a complete thorough investigation. That, that is a, a very, very cumbersome body of work. And my, my experience with the legislature is, you know, the idea sounds really good until you put the price tag on it. So I, I agree that's where we need to go. I hope that we don't wait for two or three or four years for that to be stood up because in the meantime, we have policies and rules for independent investigations and absolutely no accountability to follow those rules. And so I know that there's legislation that's being introduced. I was just on a call before this one talking about the language. And, and so I, I think we need to have an interim step until we can build that independent force. But, but I absolutely understand how difficult it is for colleagues to investigate colleagues. And I absolutely understand we have lost the trust of the public. And if we don't get the public back, we're, we're never going to be successful in the, in the long run. Paige, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, and that is that this issue, uh, you find that it is crucial to try to build back public trust? I think um, that's a really interesting question. I've actually been having a lot of debates about the idea of public trust and if that's some a goal that we want to move towards. And I think, you know, when I think about public trust, I think that means, you know, as Sue said, police are functioning exactly the way they should be functioning. So what are we trying to restore public trust in? Is it a system that is derived from slave patrols? Is that what we're trying to restore public trust in? Is it a system that disproportionately kills native people, black people, Latinx people, targets trans women of color? Is that the system we're trying to restore trust in? And I think we really need to change the narrative. So it's not about the existing system, but flipping the system on its head and making it a system that serves the communities it purports to serve, right? And reimagining the system. I think it's really important that, you know, I think the conversation of police accountability is so important, but what's implicit in that is that something has already gone wrong, right? We're holding police accountable for something that has gone wrong. So how do we on the front end ensure that that doesn't happen in the first place, that these things don't go wrong? And I think that really means, you know, taking a look at the large role and responsibilities that police have in this country and really trying to reduce those responsibilities. Police do not need to be responding to mental health calls. There are studies that say that victims of police violence who are die at the hands of police um, anywhere between 25 to 50% of those victims are in the middle of a mental health crisis, right? So really trying to reimagine that the role police play in this society and then have police accountability um, as a really effective harm reduction step, right? Um, but I think when we talk about public trust, trust in what? Because I don't think it should be trust in the existing system because we really wanna change that system. Well, um, speaking of the system, what has become a part of the system is police unions. And uh, let's talk about that issue. And uh, what is happening is uh, 
proposals. I, I hear the what is it decertification or is is, is that the, the term that is used? Yes. Yeah, so um, decertification. So police officers have to get licensed, and that's what uh, Sue's organization does: training and licensing of officers. And then um, when there is misconduct, as in any other profession they should lose their license uh, if there's proven misconduct. And so the issue there in policing is that all across the country, these state laws have been, they are pretty nominal at best. Um, they've been, uh, there's been intense lobbying for decades by law enforcement unions to make sure these laws are not particularly robust. So in our state, for example, the grounds for losing an officer's license are very narrow and there, there's a wide range of misconduct that will not result in an officer losing their license. Misconduct for which they may have been fired, they may uh, have retired or resigned in order to avoid being fired and just move to a different department. And it, it, like something like excessive force does not subject one to losing their license. So there's a legislation being sponsored by Senator Peterson that would overhaul top to bottom our state certification decertification law change the criteria, allow the state to intervene much more swiftly. The other sort of significant issue we've had for decades here in Washington is the way the law is written. The state can't take action until all appeals and processes are done so the officer can continue to work as an officer for years and years. So I won't go into it all, but suffice it to say the law needs to be reformed from top to bottom to better serve the community and to ensure that officers who do engage in significant and egregious misconduct can swiftly lose their license and don't just uh, move to a different law enforcement agency and continue doing what they were doing. It's a quite, it's a big issue, isn't it, Sue? I mean, sort of this department hopping. Yes, it is. Um, and, and I agree with what Anne's saying. The law absolutely needs to be overhauled. Um, I would add another layer of reality to that. I think there is a perception that police chiefs are hiring people not knowing what the bad misconduct was in their previous department. The fact of the matter is most chiefs who hire these bad cops know they're bad cops. And so the, the fact that they didn't make a, a decertification list or something like that um, doesn't hold a lot of water with me. Again, we go back to our, our system of policing. We have some agencies that have a hard time attracting really qualified officers. And so they, they will lower their standards to, in order to fill their staffing needs. And, and so I agree that we should not be licensing, we should not allow license, cops to keep their license when they engage in misconduct. Um, that isn't gonna cure the problem though of chiefs and sheriffs hiring people that, that have previous uh, bad behavior in their past. I want to uh, bring up again the, the issue of unions, and that is that uh, I think there's concern that sometimes officers, and this has even been brought up in teachers and other areas where they are protected to some degree because of, of being part of a union. Um, is there anything in the, this coming session that is going to deal with any of that or what, what's going on there? Well, I'll, I'll jump in real quick on that. So I think we are all supportive of labor and of the right to bargain and to ensure that there are good working conditions and benefits. The issue here in the realm of policing is that police union contracts over the last several decades have been further used to roll back other things, to embed protections uh, uh, for officers who do engage in misconduct and to eliminate transparency and to minimize civilian oversight and accountability. So the fundamental thing we need to do is take uh, police accountability systems and policies out of contracts, make them essential required best practices that government sets the way it does for its other um, employees and its other priorities for the public and not allow them to be uh, weakened or impeded uh, through um, the give and take of negotiations. We, what happens, Enrique, is not only do these protections get embedded in a way that uh, is a disservice to the public and makes it so much harder to do everything we're talking about in this session tonight, but then to make it even more audacious, 
the public is required to pay more in order to ensure that doesn't happen. I mean, what others, who would design a system that way if you were thinking about good public policy and serving the public? So that's a fundamentally important thing. We just have to be crystal clear that law enforcement is different than other public employees. Law enforcement have the right to take your life, your liberty, it is state sanctioned use of violence. They are not the same as other public employees. So when we talk about bargaining and contracts, when it comes to police, it is a completely different paradigm than for other public employees. Just as if you think about it, we have a federal consent decree for police officers. We don't have a federal consent decree for parks employees. We don't have an academy like such that Sue runs for sewer workers. We don't have an office of police accountability for other types. So police, we've already recognized in all sorts of other areas that police are very different and the standards need to be higher, not lower. And the way contracts have come to evolve over the last several decades, we now have lower standards for police than for many other public employees. And that's just not acceptable. I wanna move to uh, some of the questions that we've been receiving. We've actually received quite a, quite a few. Um, this is a question that, is came, that came in. Uh, what jurisdictions provide the best examples of meaningful systemic reform? Anybody, Sue, anybody out there doing it the way you would like to see it done? You're asking me to tell who. <laughs> I've served 300 different agencies. Uh, but you know what? I, I will give a shout out to the Everett Police Department. Um, just, just because um, every step of the way, as we have introduced our de-escalation training, all kinds of training like that, um, they have just been a stellar example of embracing um, the, the, the more safer tactics. And uh, that's not to say other agencies aren't wonderful as well, but, but Everett really stands out. So I, I can't lose, I don't wanna lose the opportunity to give a little shout out to them because they've done a great job. Um, another question, uh, chokeholds were banned by New York Police Department when uh, particularly after the Eric Garner case. Uh, what's going to make a difference here in Washington State? Sue, do you want to, I mean, Anne, do you want to take, take that? Well, the bill on tactics, as it's currently drafted, would ban chokeholds. That's Representative Johnson's bill and um, uh, any sort of neck restraints of that. Uh, I think there's a debate as, I think there will be a debate as to whether they should be prohibited in toto or allowed in particularly narrow circumstances. And states have approached that differently across the country. Uh, another question here. I wonder about the police hiring practices. What do you think of requiring applicants for police employment to have had some minimum number of years experience, maybe three years, just as an example, in some community service work, such as teaching, social work, et cetera? Oh, idea, may right? I jump in? Yeah, <laughs> please do. Uh, I am a big fan of using what are so-called preference points to encourage the kind of folks that we want in policing. So over the years, there's been something called veterans preference points where you get extra points in hiring if you're a veteran. And a recommendation I made, I don't know how many years ago now in Seattle was uh, that we should have preference points for candidates who come from a background of social work, mental health work, Teach for America, the kind of community service and skill set and problem solving and empathy that we want in officers, as well as preference points for officers who are multilingual. So that we're really encouraging the hiring to the skills and humanity that we say we want in officers. And to Sue's point about systems, that's a systemic change that we ought to make so that we're walking the talk if we say we want different type of person in policing, we've got to take some steps to get those kind of um, skills. Um, let's talk about cameras and uh, that the wearing of cameras. I know that not every police department has them, uh, but Sue, would you like to see every, every officer wear a camera? I, I would absolutely love that for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but I, I'm always gonna be the negative Nelly about the, 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 the cost involved. And so there, there's that piece of it. I do believe that everybody behaves better when there's a camera there, both the officer and the pe person they're interacting with. So I think cameras are a great benefit there. 
but I also would, would say there's a caution to be considered. Police officers go into situations that are extremely private and embarrassing, and we need to make sure that there are protections in place so people's, their worst moment in their life doesn't end up on YouTube. And, and that is a real particular issue. There also has to be some measure of sanity around the public records requests for police um, for the videos, because you're, you, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to effectively respond to a public records request for, for, for digital uh, images. So the concept of cameras is very, very good, but the devils in the details, those have to get worked out. Paige, how about nationally? What are you seeing there? What would you like to see? In regards to body cameras specifically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I should preface this with the ACLU does not endorse nor oppose body cameras for the exact reasons that Sue outlined because there are significant privacy and technology concerns when it comes to body cameras. So we do have a model policy on our website. But I think um, body cameras are honestly for ACLU National an example of the limits on procedural justice reforms that center solely on transparency and accountability. Um, there is overwhelming evidence that the transparency afforded by body cam footage does not meaningfully change police behavior nor result in more police accountability, um, whether that means firing or charging officers um, for police misconduct. Um, although it has allowed for a more honest conversation about police violence and racism um, by capturing it on video. Um, but I think, you know, it, as Sue said, it's expensive. Um, it is an incredibly expensive thing. And if the policy isn't right, it could really violate people's privacy rights. Um, and so I, I would urge caution. I think that there are some benefits to it, but I'm not sure those benefits outweigh the actual legitimate costs, like the monetary costs. So what would you say today to someone, and, and actually I even the rest of you can weigh in on this, uh, who's interested in going into law enforcement today? Uh, because, uh, you know, we, it's sort of like mass and the flag. We become this big divisive society about certain things. And becoming a police officer, I would think, or has, has fallen into that. So what would you say to someone that's going to go into, the, into this profession or wants to go into this profession? So I, I will tell you what I said to our first graduating class after the George Floyd murder and the COVID hit and all that. I said, this is the best time to go into policing. Because really? We are absolutely at the beginning of a new era. And we have the opportunity. We, we are going to train our police officers about the truth of the criminal justice system. So they don't come into it like I did blindly thinking that we are following the principles of Sir Robert Peel. That's not what our system is built on. So we're going to have the first generation of cops that really understand what they're getting into. So they don't end up like so many of my peers with 40 years going, oh my God, what have I been doing for the last four decades? I came into this to do something good but these bad disparate outcomes keep happening. And I'm not a bad person, I'm trying to do good things, but it's all coming out so wrong. We have the opportunity now to, to tell the truth, to do the training correctly, to get a grip on some of the union issues that have made it difficult for accountability. And I think the public is very, very much waiting for good, better policing. So this is the best time. I think 10, 15 years ago was probably the worst time. Anne, you agree with that? Yeah, I think for the type of people we would like to see in policing, I had a debate here a couple months ago when the Seattle mayor mentioned she wasn't going to hire the, uh, um, a permanent chief uh, when our chief resigned because the time is too uncertain. And I had the debate with this person saying, there's a certain type of person who will thrive in this environment, who will look forward to being uncertain, to know that they have an opportunity to make systemic change and to be transformational in their vision and their work. So I'm all for uh, full speed ahead in terms of hiring people who look at this as an opportunity to fundamentally change how we do policing in this country. 
And, and also Enrique, I would say that we shouldn't, this is not a personalized debate. This is not about these people as human beings are not good people or these individual. Look at every system that we have in our society. We are undergoing a need, finally realizing the need for fundamental reform in how we approach so many things. And we are stepping up and saying, we need to change that system. We need to change how we approach this. We need to serve the public better. We need to eliminate disparities. Policing shouldn't be any different. It should not be sacrosanct. It is an essential public service and we need to make sure in fact, we are serving the public. So Tim, as part of the governor's task force on all of this, what, what are you hoping will come out of the work that you're doing? At the end of the day, what we're hoping for is to prevent other families from going through what we've gone through by reducing or in an ideal world, eliminating the use of deadly force. Obviously, that's probably not a reality, but that's the goal. The other thing we're hoping to accomplish is to ensure that impacted families, impacted communities, those that are disproportionately impacted by police use of force are at the table, that they are being heard, that their perspectives, their lived experiences are the things that are, that are informing the decisions of the legislature. And I, I know, and, and we, we constantly hear about the, 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 the barrier of funding, but you know, I've heard it said that when you know better, you must do better. And if not now, when? So our hope, <clears throat> our hope is that the legislature will put the, their, the money where their mouth is across the board everybody's coming out and saying yes we need reform we need to change we need to support you know all of these different things but it's the proof is going to be when they put their money where their mouth is and that's what we're hoping for we're hoping to provide the legislature with bills legislation that they can get behind that will that they can fund that will have meaningful, real lasting change and changing the system as Paige had mentioned. That's what we're hoping for. Paige, I'm gonna give you the last word. All right, I will keep it short. Um, but I guess all I'd say is dream big. I think, I think a lot about Miriam Kaba and how she says we are only limited by our imaginations and our lack of creativity we can imagine and actualize a different world. It does not have to be this way. We just need to expand our creativity and our imaginations to dream of a new world and to actualize that new world. Well, let's hope we can dream big and actually accomplish big as well. Paige Fernandez, Ann Levinson, uh, Sue Rar, Tim Raynon, thank you so much uh, for taking the time this evening. Thank you for uh, those uh, a good crowd that turned out tonight, uh, almost 300 that we had earlier. And also for those of you that uh, shared your questions and comments, sorry, I couldn't get to everything. Uh, tried to get as many as in as I could as possible. It's just that Anne talks so much all the time, you know, so what could I do? Anyway, just kidding. Um, thank you all for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. And I hope all of you have a, a great evening. Thanks to our community partners, partners, Highline Heritage Museum, Seattle Channel, and King County Television that will be airing this conversation. Take care all. Wash your hands, wear your mask, practice social distancing, and of course, uh, take care of yourself in this, uh, this tough time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Really appreciate it.